the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, here's the question, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. I want to minister a sermon every time. What is that in your hand? John Lennon's piano, and I believe this is the piano he wrote his famous song, Imagine, was sold for 1.45 million pounds at an auction. The piano, though it is a good one, in and of itself, the sum of its parts is not worth that much. But because of who used it and the songs that were composed on it is now worth nearly a million and a half pounds. It's not just the instrument in and of itself, but it's the person who uses it that elevates its value. Concerning the person in our text, which is Moses, the Bible says in Jude 1 and verse 9, consider this, let's put it up. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed, hold on, so just check what's going on here. We're getting a glimpse into the spirit realm. Here you have Michael the archangel. So this is like one of the highest angels, ranking angels in heaven. Then you have Satan, the devil, the dragon, the serpent, the liar himself. And they're having a contention and a dispute. They're fighting over something. Look at what they're fighting over. They disputed about what? The body of Moses, a dead man. Come on. This is his corpse we're talking about here. Daring not to bring against him reviling accusation, he said, the Lord rebuke you. And I only could assume that the Lord did rebuke him and the devil got on his bike. When you think about it, a dead man's body, what is it worth? Concerning the sum of his parts, it's just a body. It's a decomposing one. But because of whose body it was, because his life was in the hands of God, the angel and the devil are contending over it. There's something about putting your life in the hands of God that will make it far more valuable and impactful than it would have been otherwise. And I want to consider where this started for this man because I believe that God wants to use your life in a great way. Throughout the Bible, we see time and again God calling people to something that is often greater than themselves. And the initiation of God using someone to do something great is an initial summoning. God proposing to them that I want to use your life for such and such a purpose. And the individual's answering of the call of God often would propel them into becoming God's instrument for that specific need. God calls Abraham from out of his people and says, I will make you a great nation. Abraham answers the call, and that's why we speak about him to this day. It is the same with Samuel, right? God calls Samuel, literally audible, Samuel, Samuel. Remember, he thought it was Eli who was calling him. And Eli says, no, 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 it's not me who's calling him. And he realizes it is God who is calling you. And then he tells him, lie down. And when God calls you again, say, here am I, Lord. And God uses Samuel's life in a great way. He causes Jeremiah. Jeremiah, in that moment, is like, but I am but a youth. He says, before you was born, I ordained you a prophet. But here's the reality about the call of God. Is that you can choose to answer it or not. When I see a no caller ID come up on my phone, or a number I do not know, you better believe they need to leave a voice message, because I ain't got no time for it. You trying to sell me something or you just out of your mind? I ain't got time for it. Okay, you got time for that. But I ain't got time for it. So I'm like, Lay. if I don't know you, <laughs> sometimes if I do know you, <laughs> the, uh, can I be honest? Depending on what kind of mood I'm in. Don't act like you don't do it. I'll just call you back later. I'll just call you back later. Come on. Sometimes you just don't feel like talking, man. You just don't feel like answering. And so you don't. It is one thing to not answer the call of somebody. It is another thing when God calls you and for you to dismiss that call. Jonah did it. God calls him to go to Nineveh. He goes to Tarshish. The rich young ruler does it. 
He says, hey, what do I lack? He says, come, sell all your possessions. Come follow me. He's calling him to be a disciple. He walks away sorrowful. And Moses, in this moment, was on the same trajectory as these two others. Moses is at the burning bush. This is a supernatural phenomenon. He's in a place of glory, a place of revelation. God reveals his name. I am that I am, Yahweh, the self-existing one. He stands on holy ground. God is calling him in this moment to lead his people out of 400 years of slavery. This is what God foretold Abraham about his descendants. And it is about to come to pass. Genesis 15 verses 13 to 14 says, Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that 400 years, for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possession. So here is God telling Abraham, this is what's going to happen in the future. Your people are going to become an entire nation, but they're going to be strangers in the land, and they're going to be enslaved. They're going to be mistreated there, but I will punish that nation. They serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. And so you've got to think about it. He's at the burning bush, this supernatural phenomenon, this, this glory, this moment of revelation. He stands on holy ground, but this is also a prophetic moment. He's like, this is what I foretold Abraham. Moses, you're the man who's going to lead the people out. God is telling him, now is the time. Exodus 3.8 says, so I have come down to deliver them out of the land, of, of the hand of the Egyptians, and bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Keep that scripture up. Right there you see the deliverance of God, how it works. Look at what he says. There's, there's three motions here. I will deliver them out. This is the deliverance of God. That God will call you out. He sees you in places. He sees you in the place of addiction. He sees you in the place of bitterness. He sees you in the place of debauchery. And he says, come out. That's how he delivers. He takes you out the strip club. He takes you out the nightclub. <laughs> They're the same thing. He takes you out of all the mess that you're in. And he says, yeah, yeah, I'm delivering you. No longer do you need to be amongst them. Come out. But he doesn't only bring out, what does he say? And then I will bring them up. So the free trajectory is God comes down, because that's where we're at. And then he takes us out to, deliver, to bring us up. God comes down. That's the gospel right there. Jesus came down to bring us out of our sin, to take us up to himself. But that, that's for free. Psalms 40 verse 2 says, he lifted me out of the slime, the miry clay, the, let me, the, the, the horrible pit, the, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon the rock and established my steps. You see it again? He took me out the miry clay. He set my feet up upon the rock. He says he's taken me out and then he brings me up. That is the deliverance of God. It is not good enough just to be out of things. That's just the beginning. Well, I don't do certain things anymore. That God's not finished with you. God also wants to bring you up. Psalm Philippians 3 verse 14 says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the what? The upward call of God in Christ. It's an upward call. We're not just saved from something, but we're saved to something. It's not just about what you've turned away from. It's also about what you're turning toward. Thank God for where you have come from, but there should be a greater anticipation for where you're going in God. Now think about this. Moses, as far as we know, is the first Hebrew to come out of Egypt. Okay, there might have been like one, two runaway slaves we don't know about them, but the Bible doesn't say anything about them. So as far as the scripture is concerned and what it gives us, Moses is the first Israelite to come out of Egypt. We know his backstory. He grew up in the house of Pharaoh. He goes out to see his brethren. He sees one of them being afflicted. So Moses hasn't got the slave mentality. He's like, what is this? He sees himself as an equal amongst men. And so he's like, why are you mistreating my brother? Moses has a bit of a, temp a temper. Moses killed the man right there. 
Well, this is a bad man. And so he kills the guy, buries him in the sand, and then word comes out, because he comes out again, and if, I think he sees two Hebrews argue with each other. Come, you're brothers, man. Like, why are you arguing with each other? And go, oh, you're going to kill us like how you killed that Egyptian? And then he realized, oh, everybody knows about that, huh? And he realized Pharaoh's going to be coming after him, and so he runs away, and he becomes a fugitive, and that's how he comes out of Egypt. And he's been out of Egypt for 40 years. So he's 80 years old at this point in time. He's come out, but that was not just the destiny of God for him, that he would be out of Egypt. In this moment at the burning bush, God is calling him up. He says, I ain't just, it, it is not just my will that you are out, that my, the children of Abraham come out, which you have. You fulfill that in some way. You're no longer enslaved by them, but, but it's that you will come up. If Moses dies in the wilderness, tending his father-in-law's sheep, his life does not have the significance that it has today. He just dies as some shepherd in the wilderness. The archangel Michael and the devil are not arguing over his body. They didn't even know about his body. God is calling him up by involving him in his purposes in the earth. What does that look like? It looks like serving the people of God. He's been saved from those who sought his life. Verse 19 says, Now the Lord says to Moses in Midian, Go return to Egypt for all the men who sought your life are dead. No one's seeking your life anymore. But well, you've been saved. You've, you've come out of that. They, that. That's no longer a problem. But now he's being sent. Now he's being summoned. He's being called by God. He's being called upwards. And to be called upward in God looks like serving others. The upward call of God is more than just your personal prospering. It's great, I am saved now, I am out of that life, and so now I live this clean, dignified, respectable Christian life. That's wonderful, amen. And now God's blessing me. So now, in, in Christ, God's hooking me up, man. We love, I keep mentioning it, I love Valentine testimony. God hooked me up with the 10K. I'm like, Lord, where's the 10K coming for me? <laughs> uh, let me just roll that in. And so, and so, it's not that just that my car is nice and my house is nice and my family is nice and my clothes are nice and all of these things. That, that's not the fulfillment. Of, because you know why? Let me tell you why. Because you can find a whole bunch of devils who, who dress even better than you do, drive a nice car than you, live in a nice house. So, so there's more to this than just that. It is the fulfilling of the purposes of God in your life. Which involves you engaging in something greater than yourself. Which is others. Now, my sermon would have concluded right here. If God called him, tell you, this would have been the end of the sermon. Like, I would have had like five more minutes and say, when God calls you, say yes. Right? If God calls him at this burning bush, hey, shoes are off, holy ground. And God says this whole, and he does say this, this whole prophetic liturgy, he recites it back like this is the time, Moses. And you are the man that I want to use. And if Moses says, yes, I will go. I will be the instrument in your hand, Lord. Send me and I will go. If he says that, then the sermon's done. You could have all gone home. We could have gone upstairs and ate cake and drink some coffee. But here's the reality. Moses doesn't say that. It doesn't go how it goes in the movies. Have you seen any of these Moses movies? You can remember that old one, The Ten Commandments? Then they had some Pixar. Then they had one with Christian Bell. I didn't watch that because I just said that was a foolishness. But anyway, you might have seen it. I ain't judging you. And so most of the time, when, when Moses at the burning bush, it's like, yes, 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 yes. But the reality was not that. If you read Exodus 3 and 4, what you read is a man trying to negotiate himself out of the will of God. It becomes quite apparent that Moses is not keen on what God is calling him to. And so now you have to hang around for another 20 minutes. Oh dear. Moses is not feeling it. Think about glory of God before him. Holy ground. Revelation from God. This is a prophetic moment. So you can have all of that and a man can turn around and be like, I'm not your guy, you know. So I just wonder, if you take away the burning bush, 
You take away the audible voice of God. You take away the revelation. You take away the holy ground. And it's even easier for the people of God, though we've come out, to not go up. And say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm not your man. I'm not your woman. He continually brings excuses to try to worm his way out. In the hope that God would move on to somebody else. Something I realize about Moses in this moment is that he lacks confidence within himself. He's a fugitive. He's been on the backside of the desert. He's been a nobody. This guy grew up in Pharaoh's house as if he was a son of Pharaoh. He was so confident he killed a man in cold blood. Didn't think twice about it and felt like it was nothing. He went to bed, got up the next day and starts walking around. Now, like, what are you guys arguing for? Like, he's the police. I'm like, dude, like, you know, that's the confidence level this guy once had. But now, his confidence is shot. And what is quite apparent is he lacks faith in God as well. There is often a link, an amalgamation many times, between our confidence in ourselves, our flesh, and our confidence in God. Consider what God tells him in Exodus 3 and verse 18. Then they will do what? Thank you, you four people who read those three words. Then they will heed your voice. This is God telling him what's going to happen before it happens. And you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please, let us go three days journey into the wilderness. He's telling them what he needs to say. That we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Just, just watch those first few words. Then they will heed your voice. That's what God is saying. Then they will heed your voice. Moses, when you speak, they're going to heed your voice. Did everybody get that? They're going to heed your voice. Verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. It's like, sir, I just done told you they're going to heed your voice. Moses turns around and says, yeah, but say they don't listen to me. And so his confidence in himself has been amalgamated with his confidence in God. He might as well have said, God, I'm not sure if you're right about this. If he believed what God was, that God was going to do what he was going to do and what God said was going to happen was going to happen, he wouldn't be saying this in this moment. He might as well have said, but God, what if you're wrong? Some people, when they have confidence in themselves, they have confidence in God. When they feel good about themselves, things are going well for their lives, their faith is through the roof. Like, yeah, man, yeah, we can do it. Yes, 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 yes. But when things are not going well for them, when they're struggling, when they're not in a good place, now they have no faith in God. You've got to question that. Is your confidence ever really in God then? Or is it just always confidence in self? If that's what's dictating. For all Moses' talk, and you know, he goes on, if you know this uh, scripture very well, he speaks about himself not being eloquent in speech and yada yada, so on and so forth. Again, he's low in confidence in self, so he has low confidence in God. You've got to consider, Moses actually has something to him and about him. Number one, he was educated in Pharaoh's house in all the ways of the Egyptians. He understands how these people think more than any other Hebrew. Number two, he's the only guy to come out of Egypt. He actually knows what it's like to live outside of being um, under the oppression, like all his life. Because he grew up in a house, he wasn't a slave in a house. And also, he's lived outside of Egypt and outside of the land. Number three, God is actually going to tell him to bring the people to the very same mountain he's meeting them on. So he's the only guy who knows the way to where God is bringing them. Number, another one, I don't know what number I was on, so I'm just going to say another one, is he doesn't have the slave mentality. You remember, there's many times that people are going to be like, let's go back to Egypt. Things were better in Egypt. And he's like, no, we need to go forward because he's never, he's never lived under that. And the last one, he's been shepherding another man's sheep for the last 40 years. He's going to shepherd God's sheep for 40 years in the wilderness as well. This was all preparation. Like, Moses, you're very much set up to be like, everything is really like, you're the guy. But Moses doesn't want to go. Because the source of his confidence when it comes to God is actually 
about himself. This is how he went wrong the first time in killing the Egyptian. He was so confident in himself, he actually went about it the wrong way and, and he ended up a fugitive. And this is how he can miss out in this moment because he is low in confidence. The confidence he has in, in himself, whether it's high or low, is determining, determining how he is relating to his God and how he is responding to God. Sometimes the biggest obstacle concerning the will of God in your life is you. I wasn't going to point at anybody else. I was going to say, it's that person. <laughs> We're just going to blame you. No, it's me. What God can and cannot do is often filtered through our limitations, what we think, our self-assessment. When we consider what God is calling us to, we consider it through the filter of self, but that's too big. I don't think I, in my ability, can do that, Lord. We consider the risk. We consider the cost. We consider our own history. Well, from where I'm coming from and the things that I've done and, and my history, and, and I don't think, no, God wouldn't want to use someone like me. We consider our failures. Sometimes we consider our present settled life and circumstances. I feel like things are quite comfortable and good for me, which they would have been for Moses as well. I don't know if I want to disturb this, Lord. We wrestle with our own insecurities. Sometimes, I'll say this as well, actually. Sometimes it's not even that we lack the faith that God can do what he says he would do. As in, if you was Moses in the situation, yeah, God, just go deliver the people, man. I, I don't doubt that you can do it. But when it comes to him working through your life, then we write ourselves off. Our faith concerning us being an instrument of God can often be shot. Why? Because we're low on confidence. And our faith is now based on that. This is often a wrestling with many uh, believers concerning this upward call. And hey, could God, can God really use my life? Can I, can I affect others? Many people, they just write themselves off. And sometimes it's not just because, well, I don't, you know, they beat themselves up, and I don't think I could, and I have got ability. It's not just, just the Moses situation. Sometimes my heart is just in another place. Hey, man, I'm all about me. It's what I'm doing, and I'm comfortable, and I'm settled, and I'm good, and I just ain't got time for that, Lord. And so what happens is you don't find many people that come up. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is ripe. But he then said something very interesting. He said, but the laborers are few. He says, the issue with the kingdom is not the harvest. He says, it's the laborers. There's many who have come out, but there's not many who are willing to come up. This is the problem. And so not many say yes to being an instrument in the hand of God because it often looks like serving others. It's great that you and God are good. Where are you? Amen. Me and Jesus are good. I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. Good. Where, where is your brother? Man, I'm good with people. Like, I've forgiven them all. Set free. Good. Relationally. But then when it comes to, hey, what's that in your hand? I want to use your life. Then we say, well, Lord, well, I've got a few things that I need to, I don't see how this is going to work. And we often don't give the right answer. And so here is Moses with all these doubts, his shortcomings, he's wrestling with it, his comfortable life that he has that will be disrupted. And he's wrestling within himself as he stands before his God. Because God is calling him. and God wants to use him. And God sees this. He sees where he's at. He's analyzing the situation. Hey, say they don't listen to me. I just don't think I'm the person. And he's given his whole thing. And then what does God do? God asks a question. What is that in your hand? I love God. Come on now. Say they say the Lord does not appear to... Put this text up for me, please. Verse 1 first. Hallelujah. Say, say they don't listen to my voice. He's whining, he's whining, he's whining. Suppose they say the Lord does not appear to you. What does God say? 
What is that in your hand? You didn't even answer it. <laughs> like, I don't told you already, bro. What is that in your hand? It's like, huh? like, it just changes the whole thing. So when God asks a question, we're learning that God's actually trying to show us something. Because I'm sure God knows that he's got the rod in the hand. Moses answers and says, a rod. In and of itself, a rod is just a shepherd's stick. It's a stick, a long, thick stick. That's all it is. Other than the clothes on his back, his wife, his children, this is all he has to his name. Materially, literally, it's this staff, this rod, and his clothes. Because he's living in Jethro's house. And those are Jethro's sheep. sheep and, and he'd be eating Jethro's food too. So everything there is Jethro's. You ain't got nothing, Moses. All the man has to his name, materially, is the clothes he's wearing, the sandals he's taken off as he stands on holy ground, and the rod that's in his hand. So God's looking at him and assessing the situation. He's thinking, I want to use this man, but he's got, you know, he lacks confidence. And all. So I'm going to show him something. I'm going to ask him a question. What is that in your hand? A rod. And it's almost like God turns around and shows him, well, then that's all I need. You think I need, if you got more than a rod to your name, you've got more than Moses had to his name in this moment. God's one of the greatest leaders in the Bible. God's like, I don't need much. I just need what you got. He says, a rod. And it's all God needed. And you actually see a trail of this throughout the scripture. Because all David had was a, was what five smooth stones? God didn't even need all five of them. He said, "We got you. Just got one. All right, that's enough. We'll take this giant. Not a problem." All Samson needed against a thousand first time was a jawbone of a donkey. Is that? That's it. All right, that's good. All the widow had was a jar of oil in her house. Remember the prophet comes and says, "Ah, oh, I got this problem. I got this problem. Da, 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 da. What have you got in your house? Well, I ain't got much. I ain't got much. I didn't ask you what you didn't have." What do, you got it, what do you have in your house? A small jar of oil. That's what God needs. Jesus took five loaves and two fish. He says to the side, go and find out what we got. Nobody had no food. Everybody turned up with a hungry belly. But one child had this packed lunch. And I always wonder how the disciples got the packed lunch off the child. Because I'm the child and I know there's always hungry people looking at me. You know how we are. When you have something nice, you give them sweets, you put them in your pocket, don't you? You slip them in your mouth. Yeah, you keep it secret. You don't want us to know. I know how you stay. It's okay. So I can understand how this kid is like, hey, get your big grubby hand off my lunch. So I just, I just think the disciples just grips the brother up. <laughs> Took it off him. And then come before Jesus like, yeah, yeah, we got some five loaves too. But they said it. What is this among so many? He's like, don't you know me already? All Moses had was a rod. All David had was a stone. All the woman, the widow had was a jar of rod. This is, all I need is what we got right now. What is in your hand becomes something significant when you place your life in the hand of God. When you're willing to obey God and respond to God, and you're willing to come up, it's like whatever you had becomes more than the sum of its parts. See, it's not that you need to have supreme confidence in yourself. And if you have that, glory to God. Just don't annoy people with it. But here's what you need. You just need supreme confidence in God. You don't have to have this ultimate confidence in yourself. Because most of us wrestle with doubts and insecurities about our ability. We're just, we're just not built like that. Some of you might be, but the rest of us, man, you know, we got our GCC results, and it was kind of like, ah, we're trying to count. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> How many A to Cs did I get? Man? Oh, man, we've got some intelligent people. You're looking at like, really? I was a straight A student. Wow, the rest of us, man, the rest of the world, we just got high and by, man. And so we realize we have our faults and we have our weaknesses, but what you need is a confidence in God. God comes and calls this man when he's broken. When he has nothing to his, he was he was in Pharaoh's house. He was a prince of Pharaoh. God's like nah, and then he waits for him to be forty years in the wilderness. He goes, now you're ready, because what I need to show you is that your confidence needs to be in me. I don't care about your past. I don't care about what you've done. I don't care about your stuttering speech. I don't care about none of that stuff. What have you got, Moses? 
That is all that I need. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See that confidence there? I can do all things. It's not in myself. Through Christ who strengthens me. Your confidence should come through who God is. Your confidence in yourself is not what should be dictating. And so you've got to think about it. You, your confidence in yourself should not be determined in faith levels in God. No, faith levels in God should be determined confidence in self. God can use what you have. It doesn't have to be much. But you've got to be willing to lay it down for God. You've got to be willing to say, yes, Lord, Lord, you can use my life. Mark 8.35, Jesus presents with us with a paradox. For whoever desires to save his life, the Bible says, will lose it. But he who loses his life. Now, this is why I like this uh, particular uh, uh, um, account of this. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It's not just, just losing your life for losing your life's sake, but because for the gospel. Because you're willing to serve in my kingdom. You're willing to be a part of something bigger than just yourself. Your Christianity, the spear of your Christianity is not just bless me, bless me, bless me. Heal me, heal me, heal me. Open this door. Bring breakthrough. Do this in my life. Or this person. And it's just you. Bless God. God's good. He will help you. But there's something about you that breaks beyond that. And you realize that it needs to be about others as well. And so we start to see Moses, the purposes of God begin to unfold in Moses' life from this moment. The possibilities of God begin to unfold instead of him being restricted by the limitations of himself. What are the possibilities of God in your life? They only begin to unfold when you begin to lay your life down for God. You good with God? Yes, preacher. You good with other people? Yes, sir. God wants to use your life. As a church movement, we're known as something called a lay movement, which is very simply understood. We raise up leaders from without the congregation. That's how we do it. And so every pastor that you would come across in our fellowship of churches once walked through the doors of their church or a church and was a regular sinner and they got saved and then they started to grow in the things of God and they were discipled. God called them and they answered that call and then God began to use their crummy little abilities to do something great. If you come across most of the preachers in our fellowship, we do not have letters after our name. M-A, P-H-D. Praise God for all you M-A, P-H-D people, man. We love you. We need smart people. All my kids are going to have all that kind of stuff, man. We'll be like, hey, man, salute to you. Most of us don't. We're just regular people. We're a lay movement. Regular, you should know that already about me, man. You should realize. Some of you know already, man. Like, yeah, well, you didn't have to tell us. Regular people like Moses. God finds, and you know what he does? He brings us out of our mess. Brings us out. And then he cleans us up a little bit, and then he starts to call us up. Because he says, my kingdom needs laborers. And then every day, average people are used by God, not because they're great, but because they're willing to lose their lives and put their life in the hands of God. Moses is unsure about himself. God's question shows him the little that you have, Moses, is enough. What's in your hand can be used greatly if you're in God's hand. Because when God touches something, it becomes more than the sum of his parts. You are not an excuse, I hope you're getting what I'm saying here, that God cannot use you. So God's like, I want to use your life. Please. Don't bring yourself as the excuse. Well, Lord, if you look at, doesn't he later on say, did I not make the blind? Did I not make the, like, dude, this is not an issue. I just need your willingness to be used by me. What we need is a supernatural touch from God. Supernatural dimension on our lives. 
Moses, I'm going to conclude. Moses puts the rod down and it turns into a snake. If Moses was thinking in that moment, hey, I never knew my rod could do that. <laughs> Sorry, I just find that funny. Like, ah, this time my rod could turn to a snake. No, Moses, it couldn't. You couldn't do that, never would have. You, you dropped that rod many times and never turned into a snake. But when God would touch something, it goes beyond the sum of its parts. Now you've got to think about it. What have you got in your hand? i got a stick, Lord. Okay, yeah, that's good enough. You know, it's that same rod. You remember later on when the, when the children of it, oh, let me roll back. It's that same rod that, that Moses often is lifting up when all these plagues are coming down, destroying the most powerful nation in the world. I'm telling you, man, Phil would have been having nightmares about the rod. <laughs> Every time he lift up that stick. Do you remember when he touched the stick? Touched the now and the now turned to blood? Like, God, oh, man, when that serpent ate the serpents. You remember that moment? Come on, man. And then when, the, when Egypt and Pharaoh's army are coming to, to capture them, and they have the Red Sea there, and they have the armies of the most powerful nation coming after them, what does he say? He says, stretch out the rod. Now the people are looking at him like, oh, man, that, hey, Moses, don't lose that rod. <laughs> Keep that rod, and he's holding that rod, and then the seed divide. Go back to the burning book. What have you got in your hand? For 40 years, this rod is nothing. It's just there to keep sheep. And now he stands in front of a Red Sea. But because his life is in the hands of God, it's divided. There's a time where the people are thirsty, right? What does God say? Get the rod. You know, wait a Moses, you ain't got a rod. Conquer him. I just brought him out. Get the rod. Gets the rod. And he says, go and strike the rock. And he quenches the first. You've got to understand, there's around 2 million people are going to have their first quenched because this man struck a rock. Look how much water is coming out of that rock. There's a time when they're in battle. And the Bible says that Moses has to go on the top of a hill. And then Moses, with that rod again, has to lift it up. And every time he lifts it up, the people are winning. Joshua and the armies are winning. And then when his arms get tired and the rod come down, they start losing. So they're like, hold the rod up. <laughs> What's wrong? <with> it? <laughs> and then two brothers, Aaron and her, they, 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 they have the revelation. Maybe we should help him. Because we realize it's not just Mo, it's th that, that rod, man. God liked to use that rod. And they hold up his arms and the people have victory. This is the, th what is that in your hand? All these years, it was nothing. I was just out. I was glad. I'm saved. I'm in church. I'm living for God. Things are going okay. You know, God's blessing me. He's helped me. You know, then I got a job. I look after Jeffro's sheep. I got a wife. I got children. And, you know, then that's my testimony. God has blessed me. Da -da -da. Wonderful. But God came to a moment in this man's life where he's like, no, 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 no. I, I took you. You came out for more than that. I came, I, you came out so I can bring you up. What is that in your hand? And in Moses responding, put his life in the hands of God and all of a sudden that rod is now worth a lot more isn't it it would later on in Exodus 4.20 be called the rod of God that rod in Moses' hands how much more your life in the hands of God how much more a man puts his life in God's hands and the angel Michael the, and the devil are fighting over his body you know, there's no account of them fighting over anybody else's body. Abraham dead. No, no. David dead. But Moses? No, we're going to fight over this. You ain't taking this. You, if you actually, it's, it's quite powerful. If you read the account of Moses' death, you know he dies alone and God buries him. God buried him. God himself says, no, no, no. All you guys can go. This was my servant. I'm going I'm, I'm to initiate his funeral. Because he came to a place, and it was a struggle, but he finally came to a place where he says, I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to put my life in the hands of God. And his life became way more impactful than the sum of his parts. What is in your hand this morning? And I'm saying to you, whatever it is, that's all God needs. You just got to be willing to surrender your life and not just be willing to come out, but come up. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. In respect to God, the person.